dear uh, distinguished guests, my colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen. I am happy to read the citation of Professor Sanjay Gubind Dhande, Institute Fellow 2013, as follows. Professor Sanjay Gubind Dhande served Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, as a faculty member from 1979 to 2012, and was the director of the institute from 2001 to 2012. Born on February 14, 1948, Professor Dhande received his B.E. degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Pune and his doctoral degree from IIT Kanpur with an outstanding academic record. After completing his academic work in the United States, he returned to India to accomplish a new vision of computer-based engineering. Professor Dhande is recognized as a founder of the technology of computer-aided design in India with contributions in both academia and industry. He led the initiatives of introducing several other computer-based technologies like rapid prototyping, 3D printing, rapid tooling, and reverse engineering. Autoplay, used by leading aircraft manufacturers of the world, was an innovative car technology developed by him for the Aeronautical Development Agency. Apart from this, Professor Dhande has also developed indigenous car technology for the automotive and cellulary industries in India. Through wide-ranging courses and training programs, he has built a cadre of faculty and specialists in this subject. Professor Dhande has been the founder and mentor director of several national institutes of higher learning, including IIT Jodhpur, PDPM IIIT DM Jabalpur, IIIT M Gwalior, IIST EM Kanpur. He has served as a member of the Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, National Manufacturing Competitiveness Council, and several other organizations. He has also been an independent director on the board of ONGC, Bides Limited, and Naiveli Lignite Corporation Limited. He was also a member of the International Academic Advisory Panel of Government of Singapore. He is currently a member of the University Grants Commission and founder director of Mahindra Ecol Centrale. Professor Dhande is a recipient of a number of awards and fellowships, including Padma Sri for his outstanding contributions to academia. Professor Dhande has guided more than 120 postgraduate students and published about 135 research articles. He has also two books to his credit. Under his leadership, the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Environmental Engineering and Management, Design Program, and several centers of excellence were established at IIT Kanpur. These were examples of his vision transforming the world of technical education in the country. Over nearly four decades, Professor Dhande served the institute with distinction. He played a key role in transforming the campus by augmenting and improving the infrastructure. On this Foundation Day, we recall Professor Dhande as a leader who made significant contributions to the institute. Thank you very much.
Unfortunately, due to, uh, pri due to his prior commitments, Dr. Dhande could not be present here today. Uh, but we remember and honor his contributions to the Institute. Uh, we will now be taking a break for high tea. Uh, I request everyone to move out for refreshments. Uh, the session will, re will resume at 11.30 after refreshments. Welcome back to everybody to the celebration of the Institute Foundation Day and the Distinguished Alumnus Award Ceremony. Uh, one of the fundamental aspects to any institute, and in particular to IIT Kanpur, are the students we produce. The engineers, the scientists, the leaders, the entrepreneurs, and other individuals we produce are what define us to the outside world. The alumni of this august institution have achieved great heights in varied fields, from engineering and sciences to leadership and social service. Every year, the institute bestows upon its alumni the highest honor that institute gives to its former students, the Distinguished Alumnus Award. I request Professor K.S. Venkatesh, the Secretary of the Alumni Association, to come on stage and give a brief description of the award. Uh, before uh, Sir presents, I would request the guests to please uh, take their place in the diagram. Well, here are some brief, brief facts about the Distinguished Alumnus Award. This award is the highest award uh, instituted by the Board of Governors of the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, for its alumni in recognition of their achievements. So nominations for these awards are invited through the Alumni Association website, the newsletter, email, and other media also. Now, all nominations are received by the secretary of the association and are evaluated by a committee constituted by the director of IIT Kanpur. The director is also the chair of the committee. There is one member of the governing board. There's the dean of students affairs, one industrialist or manager, one non-alumnus faculty member of IIT Kanpur, and the Dean of Resources and Alumni. The Secretary Alumni Association serves as the member secretary of the committee. So that's the structure of the committee that determines the Distinguished Alumnus Awards. IIT Kanpur alumni have excelled in diverse fields of activity, and the DAA may be given for outstanding achievements in any field pertaining to the service of humanity at large. It's not restricted to academic or you know, any narrow field of performance. Some of the areas in which an alumnus has been awarded include entrepreneurship, management, and professional and academic excellence. Including this year's awardees, there have been 95 recipients of the award so far. The Electrical Engineering Department has the maximum number of awardees, count, counting to 30. And the batches of 1969 and 75 together share the largest number of awardees of 10 each. Now, this year's awardees are the following. Professor Jaydev Mishra, BTEC E69, for his outstanding contribution in the field of computer science and engineering in the area of concurrent processing. Professor Deepankar Das Sharma, MSc Physics 77, for his outstanding contribution in understanding the structure and properties of condensed matter by employing synchrotron radiation and Professor Vijay Kumar, BTEC ME83, for his outstanding contributions in the area of control and contributions uh, on multi-robot formations. Professor D.D. Sharma will be honored today, and Professor Vijay Kumar will be honored tomorrow, and he will be giving an institute lecture tomorrow. Professor Jaydev Mishra is unable to come because he is out of the country at the moment. Thank you. Uh, I now request the Head of Department of Physics, Professor Avinash Singh, to read out the citation for Professor D.D. Sharma. Uh, Professor Dipankar Das Sharma obtained his integrated MSc degree in physics from IIT Kanpur in the year 1977 and PhD from IIC Bangalore in 1982. 
Professor Sarma started off his career as a research associate in ISC. He has worked as guest scientist at Kern Forschungsanlage Germany as a visiting professor at the University of Tokyo, the Instituto de Struttura de la Materia, CNR, Rome, and Trieste. He was the MLS chair professor as well as uh, the founder chairman of the Center for Advanced Materials at Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, ISCS, Kolkata during 2006 to 8. He has been a member of the faculty at Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore since 1986, and is currently a professor and the chairman of the department. He also holds time-bound um, 2011 to 16, uh, joint appointments as a guest professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy, Uppsala University, Sweden, and a distinguished scientist at, of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, India. He is or has been a distinguished honorary uh, adjunct professor of a number of institutions such as JNCASR, Bangalore, 2003 onwards, TFR, Mumbai, 2003 to 9, and 11 to 14, I, uh, I, I Sir Kolkata, 2007 to 9, ISCS Kolkata, 2004 to 6, and 2009 to 14, and SN Bose uh, National Center for Basic Sciences Kolkata, 2014 to 17. Professor Sarma is a world leader in two distinct research areas strongly correlated electron systems and semiconductor nanoparticles with profound contributions in several specific sub-areas under uh, these two broad categories of scientific research. Professor Sarma has been instrumental in contributing to the growth of science in India. He is a pioneer among Indians in, all, uh, in, in the field of investigations of properties of matter employing synchrotron radiation. He has played a significant role in providing access to international synchrotron facilities for the Indian scientists. Besides publishing a large number of papers in the topmost journals, he has been invited by many international conferences all around the world to deliver uh, keynote, plenary, or invited talks. There are many uh, leading scientists who have worked with him in close collaboration in numerous projects. He has been serving in a large number of national, national committees to facilitate research and research organizations. For example, as a member of Scientific Advisory Board, CRANN, Trinity College Dublin, Ireland, 2012 to 13 and 14 to 16, and Chairman of the Research Council of National Chemical Laboratories, 2010 to 13 and 13 to 16, Member of the Council of Rajaramanu Center for Advanced Technology, 2005 to 8 and 11 to 16, of Indo French Center for the Promotion of Advanced uh, Research, 2009 to 12, of Indian National Science Academy, 2009 to 11 of Asia-Pacific Center for Theoretical Physics, Pohan, Korea, 2008-10, and chairman of the proposed uh, review committee, uh, uh, Electra Synchrotron Center, Trieste, 2003-10. He has served in the editorial board for a, uh, of a large number of science journals. Innovation is a hallmark of uh, Professor Sarma's work. Besides this, he is able to uniquely combine with perfect ease sophisticated experimental techniques with various uh, theoretical approaches on one hand, and physics and uh, chemistry, physical uh, chemistry on the other, uh, providing a very uh, distinctive uh, approach. Professor Sarma has been recognized for his work, not only nationally, but also internationally. Even as a young scientist, he received the UNESCO Biennial Javed Hussain Prize in 1989 for his contributions in physics. Since then, Professor Sarma has received many national and international awards and honors among which the notable, notable ones are uh, Shanti Swarup Bharnagar Award 1994, G.D. Birla Award for Scientific Research 2005, Alumni Award for Excellence in Research for Science conferred by ISC 2005, uh, Fikki Award for Innovative R&D 2006 7 uh, TWAS Physics Prize 2006, the Steven uh, Raman Award for Physical Sciences 2006, J.C. Bose National Fellow 2006 to 16, National Research Award in Nanosciences and Technology, 2009, and uh, HK uh, Ferodia Award for Excellence in Science and Technology, 2013. He's an elected fellow of International, uh, Indian Academy of Sciences, 93, National Academy of Sciences, 2000, Indian National Science Academy, 2001, the World Academy of Sciences, uh, 2007, and American Physical Society, 2007. He has now been selected to receive the honorary doctorate degree of uh, Uppsala University together with Professor um, Arish uh, Arye uh, Varshel, Nobel Prize winner for chemistry in 2013, and Professor Linda uh, Petzold, Department of Computer Science and Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of California, Santa Barbara. 
The Distinguished Alumnus Award is being uh, conferred upon Professor Dipankar Das Verma for his outstanding contributions in understanding the structure and properties of condensed matter employing synchrotron radiation. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we move on to honoring uh, Professor Sharma, I'd like to request uh, Mrs. Nikta Manna to kindly come on stage and present a bouquet and a shawl to uh, Mrs. Abha Sharma. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I now request the Honorable Director, the Honorable Chairman, Board of Governors, and the Honorable Chief Guest, and uh, the Secretary Alumni Association to kindly present the, award, uh, the Distinguished Alumnus, Alumnus Award to Professor Sharma, which includes a sash, a citation, and a silver plaque. Thank you, sirs. Uh, we will now move on to the Foundation Day lecture. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Prabhat Munshi, the Dean of Resources and... Uh, uh, sorry? Oh, right. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, Professor Sharma will speak now. Uh, uh, Professor Sharma, I request you to come and share your thoughts with the gathering. For a moment, I was thankful to Anurag for the mistake, <laughs> because uh, I'm always a little tongue-tied and short of words on occasions like this. I must say that uh, I'm deeply honored and touched by my alma mater's this gesture of giving this COVID as award to me. With great humility, I accept it. I know that a very large portion of what I am today is contributed by IIT Kanpur, like Professor Ananda Krishna, Satyamurti, as well as Indranil mentioned, uh, there are certain unique aspects of IIT Kanpur which I'll never forget and the contribution that it has done, given to me, in my personal life and in many different ways. Um, this has been mentioned already. Uh, this morning, several people asked me uh, that you were in physics, how come you're doing chemistry today? And some places they tell me you're in a chemistry department, how come you're doing physics? This seamless moving back and forth between different disciplines is something that IIT Kanpur taught us. It's, it wasn't only physics and chemistry. There's a, often a confusion about whether I do theory or I do experiment, and whether I was taught engineering subjects. Engineering subjects played a very important role in my training because as an experimental scientist, whenever I had to design an experiment and I made a perspective drawing, I knew exactly where the hidden lines should appear as dashed line, and my, my mechanic used to be extremely thrilled, so my job got done much faster than all other PhD students because he could understand what I'm drawing and I could convey very easily with them. And also I must mention the humanities courses. This morning, my teacher was honored, uh, Professor Rao. Uh, these humanities courses, I think, were extraordinarily important and they continue to be important. So whenever in any organization they argue about dropping the humanities courses from being taught from the curriculum of 
engineering or science students, I feel very deeply hurt because I think what we are trying to make here are human beings, not scientists and engineers. And humanities courses give a tremendous perspective of your role and your position and your, what you need to do in this society. Besides the fact that it also helped me to keep my grades high because I consistently got uh, good grades in that. And also, I must admit that another very valuable thing that I got from IIT Kanpur is my wife, uh, who was also a student here. We were students together in 1972, 42 years ago. And as a 17-year-old, when she smiles at me and when she does that even today, and reminds me of these, helped me to bridge these 42 years, uh, it's been a great pleasure and source of strength for me. And I'm sure that uh, she must have felt a little hesitant coming onto the podium stage because the only time as students we were called on the podium is to be reprimanded for not having done well in the quiz. And uh, I remember our grades, it's a family secret, I'll not let it out, but uh, we were always apprehensive of being hauled up to the front of the class. And in fact, the last member of our family, we have three sons, two in between, some of us escaped to IIT Bombay, but the third one graduated from IIT Kanpur. And uh, it's been, uh, so in every aspect, Adi Kanpur has given me so much that I feel very, very closely associated and I owe it to Adi Kanpur for everything that I have learned and I have got in this life. And I thank all of you for your kindness to have invited me here today and to have honored me thus. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and I apologize for the error. Uh, we move on to the next, uh, which is uh, the Foundation Day lecture. So I would like to invite Prof Professor Pr Prabhat Munshi, the Dean of Resources and Alumni, to kindly introduce the speaker. Thank you, Anurag. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Baldev Raj. He's uh, currently the director of National Institute for Advance at Studies in Bangalore. He is also the president of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. And he is also the chairman, board of governors for IIT, Gandhi Nagar. He is the president elect, Council of Academics of Engineering and Technological Sciences, CATES, which is a conglomerate of all the engineering academies of some 200 countries. And he's the chairman of Research Council, Defense DMRL, Hyderabad, and of course, the JCBS fellow of DST. Uh, it will be difficult for me to introduce him in this brief time, but I will summarize it quickly. Dr. Baldev Raj has assumed responsibilities as the director of National Institute for Advanced Studies, Bangalore, one of India's leading multidisciplinary institutions a distinguished scientist and former director of Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research in Kalpakam. Dr. Baldev Raj has helped advance several challenging technologies, especially those related to the fast breeder reactor and the prototype fast breeder reactor. He also nurtured and grown excellent schools of global stature in nuclear materials and mechanics, non-destructive evaluation, nanoscience and technology, and robotics and automation. He pursued his work in interdisciplinary domains of energy, cultural heritage, medical technology, nanoscience and technology, and education. He has been responsible for providing solutions to many unsolved problems in strategy and security in the, uh, sectors in the country. He's the author of more than uh, 9, 000, uh, 970 academic papers in peer-reviewed journals and along with 70 books in special journal volumes. Dr. Baldev Raj has been recognized by way of more than 100 awards, 400 honors, keynote, invited lectures and assignments in more than 30 countries. The recipients of Padma Shri, the other awards include the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian Nuclear Society, the Homi Bhabha Gold Medal, the Distinguished Material Science Award, Materials Research Society of India, etc., etc. He is a distinguished alumni of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, a member of Circle of Advisors, Cambridge University, UK, and a member of Search Group for the Queen Elizabeth Prize in Engineering. Dr. Baldev Raj is also a fellow of all the Science and Engineering Academies in India, 
the German Academy of Sciences of the World, and he is the chairman of the Board of Governors of IIT Gandhinagar, a member of court of Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, and of course, president-elect of Cates. He's honorary member, International Medical Sciences Academy. Dr. Baldevaraj is known to have mentored hundreds of children, students, scientists, and technologists, inspiring them to pursue high levels of professionalism in the pursuit of science and technology without losing sight of the need for exemplary ethical practices. I now invite Dr. Baldevaraj. And this is the light. Where is the light? No light. Laser is not. Professor M. Ananda Krishnan, a distinguished educationist, a mentor, and a person with deep insights into education. I believe IIT Kanpur at this juncture is very fortunate to have him as a chairman board of governors to take it to the next level. My good friend, Professor Indranil Manna, the director of IIT Kanpur, well known among the material science and metallurgy community for his work and leadership qualities, Mrs. Indranil Manna. I am delighted that I am on a day when my dear friend, Professor D.D. Sharma, is being honored with Distinguished Alumnus Award. I can tell from my personal experience that nothing gives you more honor than receiving a Distinguished Alumnus Award. I think this is the memory which stays with you all the time. And I think when you are a student at that time, you start thinking, maybe I'd be worth this institute one day, and I'd be called upon with this honor. I think this is something which no other award touches. So I'm happy for D.D. Sharma and Mrs. D.D. Sharma that they are here to receive this award. I know his exemplary innovative work and all that. Professor Satyamurti, again a person whom I have admired all along, though my association has been Limited, Professor Dande, who is not here, and Professor Rao, whom I know only today. I think it's wonderful. And to be invited on the Foundation Day is a great honor. When Professor Indran El Manna requested me that why don't I come and give the talk, indeed I was humbled and I was honored as to what I talk. So two topics crossed my mind. One was that I could speak on place of India in Asia and the world. And second was that I talk about energy because I've been thinking about energy almost for 40 years. So I left the first topic for another forum and maybe for IIT Kanpur on another day. But I'm going to talk about a perspective on challenges and opportunities to meet energy demands of emerging and aspiring India. Emerging India, you see in the newspaper, media, in all the discussions. So I need not define that. But I think aspiring India, everybody thinks in different way. And I think there's no definition of aspiring India. To me, aspiring India is providing quality of life to the human beings and all the species in this country with internal security, 
and external security, being sensitive to the culture of this country and secularism of this country, and also being secular in its relations all over the world. It's a tall order. I think if we really have to be aspiring India, we have to satisfy all that. All of us can write essays on as to how close we are for the aspiring India. But I think we have to be the country which is different than other countries, even when we cross all the challenges and come to the top of the table among the countries. This would remain a challenge, and it can be achieved only by a combination of interdisciplines and also by philosophy and spirituality. I'm very fortunate today that I had an institute where this was the seed of a thought which was sowed by J.R.D. Tata when he envisioned that institute and brought Dr. Raja Ramna as the first director. In this institute, we sort of do things which go beyond the envelope and try to define ourselves as to how we can contribute. Can I see? Is there's no light here. It's fine. I'll manage with this. If you look at the challenges, they originate from demography, concern with respect to the parameters on the Earth planet, and equity concerns. And equity concerns are mostly because of lack of ethics. They are not there if you have ethics embedded in your life, whatever we are, whether we are scientists, politicians, or the business people. We have increasing demands on clean and competitive energy, water, agriculture, and healthcare. As we have the challenges, we have perhaps the highest opportunity today among all the nations to do innovations and advance the frontiers. Longevity, we have old age problems, new strains of diseases, much more in this country as compared to many other, because we have still not challenged malaria, TB, TB, and many other diseases. We have aging assets and new high-performing assets. How do we manage? What kind of technology we put in new assets and how we manage our aging assets? Today, in the world of globalization of economies and increased competitions, it is difficult to stay at top. It is difficult to compete. One example would suffice. If you go back to 1800s, we had 40% share of the manufacturing in the world. And you come to 2014, we have only 14% share in the manufacturing. And we all are convinced that unless we increase it to beyond 20%, we would not be able to generate employment. But the advantage is we can embed manufacturing and the, our capability in the computational intelligence, softwares and all that to challenge it. Increase social and work stresses, how we can keep the focus of the young people for 40, 50 years, like our leaders, like our mentors, to stay in one field and continue to go deeper and deeper and do something profound. And of course, ultimately, if you can manage the human resources, and particularly in the context of engineers, who in every country create the wealth with ethics and provide a quality of life. Unfortunately, the engineering position, sometimes it is mixed with science, sometimes it is mixed with plumber and the welder, and it is very difficult to sort of say who the engineer is. Because the engineer is optimizing all the time. It optimizes a combination of physics, chemistry, mathematics, practices, and all that, and delivers the product. So how do you define an engineer? And how does the policymaker understand the engineer? Directions of technology. Technologies are performing at frontiers of limit of performance. Every time when you see what is happening, especially I'm talking about energy, you find that, oh, the world has moved multi-steps forward. Where the country would make a decision to put the energy, put the finance on and give a commitment? It's very difficult today to decide where do you put the money for the future technologies? And how do you take care of the needs 20, 30 years down the line. I'd present you some scenarios in energy, and you'd understand what I'm mentioning. 
We have very large structures. On one hand, the structures are increasing in size to be able to manage the challenges. On the other hand, we have nano devices and all that. Design analysis, virtual reality, health diagnosis, asset management are just a few examples. We need innovations not only at the type of the concepts and principles and materials, we need these innovations in all stages of life cycle of technology. Newer materials, processes, newer performance, and to me, advanced sensors are the paradigm changer. All of us who have done science, if I can do one unique sensor, I think I have a name in science. I can really change the definition of science and what I can achieve with that science. Can we do some agni show sensors, either for our science or for our technology, which would make a lot of difference? Another field which is making a great difference is the robotics and the relevant automation with a high amount of intelligence. And I think these are the areas which are really going to be helpful, whether we talk about agriculture or health or food or whatever. Just about a week or 10 days, we were discussing the sustainable green revolution, and we are talking about precision agriculture. And I think at the end of the discussion, it came out that unless we are able to do some very unique sensors and do a low-cost automation, it would be difficult to keep the young people attracted to the agriculture, because the returns would not be more, and the resources would be very costly. So I think there is a lot of opportunities for institutes like IIT Kanpur to be able to having a specific focus on this field. I'm not going to read that. I can leave this presentation with IIT Kanpur, or if any of you write to me, I'd be too happy to send it. The energy, there are various factors. With respect to water, though, the technologies looks to be very simple to grasp and to be able to carry forward. The problem is the water condition in this country has deteriorated a lot. Whether you take the large bodies or whether you take water which we need to drink or whether for the industries, whether you take the quantity of water, I think the challenges are very huge. And it's more today a management problem rather than science and technology. Science would continue to grow, new solutions would continue to come, but I think it's a management of the water has become a big issue, and all the people have a role to play in that. We are causing a tremendous damage to the health of the people. Many of the diseases become much more severe if the water is not proper. In fact, I think the two greatest gifts the nature gave us were the good air and good water. And I think we have sort of lost uh, handle on both of these things. And it is our responsibility collectively to be able to address that. Healthcare, most important here is affordability. And concerns are many, including ineffectiveness of antibiotics, typical diseases which happen in this country. And you see the sufferings of the people. And I think just about a few days back, Amir Khan gave a uh, uh, sort of a presentation in Satyamev Jayate where how TB is affecting the masses and how it has taken a heavy toll. There are, on the other hand, successful models, very unique in India, like Arvind, Shankara, Shetty, who have really taken the science, technology, and management to be able to provide solutions. This is the most important aspect all my life I've seen, starting with the models of Homi Baba, Vikram Sarabhai, Stish Tavan, and many others that only simple and robust management principles and practices work. Unfortunately, we are not able to discover those simple and robust management principles and practices where the accountability and the autonomy goes side by side. There are paradigm shift in the management concepts. We need today to act fast. We have to involve very diverse disciplines. It is not that a single person can move forward in spite of the eminence and the capability. We need organic and inorganic growths, interdisciplinary decisions, and ethics and equity is knocking at us. While the country is not doing good to take care of the poor people, it is doing extremely good to adding billionaires in the list. So if we have a good ethics and equity, I think there are ways. With the corporate social responsibility on hand, I believe at least a few would show the way, and then with the ethics and equity, we can do many of the things. 
Creating leaders, IIT Kanpur can be very proud of creating outstanding leaders, continues to create leaders, and I think this is one area, if we can do, I think we have solved the challenges. Otherwise, whosoever competence we may have, we never solve the problem. We need young leaders, we need leaders at every age, we need senior leaders, we need also definition of what is nationally relevant. I don't think if you ask all the people in this hall and say what is nationally relevant, we have an answer. We have not even discussed and deliberated on what is nationally relevant. We all feel what is relevant for me, what is relevant for my group, what is relevant for my family, what is relevant for my institute. If we are very visionary, then we think about what is relevant for my feel like energy being applied to that. And I think even if we enhance every year 10% gender synergy, I think we'd have achieved a lot. We are again lacking very much, we talk quite a lot, but today there are companies like Tata Consultancy Services, a few days back, I was addressing their board and senior executives, and they told that they have more than, uh, I think, 100,000 women out of uh, 300,000 total employees, and they have discovered very innovative ways in our culture to be able to bring the gender. So if one organization can do, I think many organizations can do in this country. If you look at the population, we had a typical pyramid which became uh, slowly to a bell. And uh, that means the population which is aging is increasing. This is the situation among seven billion in the world. We are very fortunate that in this country our demography is highly favorable. And I think that is where we have unique challenges and unique opportunities. If we handle it well, we can do extremely well. If we don't handle it well, we are at disadvantage. And when we talk about education and skill sets, how much of them are employable, how much would contribute to the country, we create the best people, would they stay in the country or go out? Would we be able to attract the best people from the world to be a part of our challenges? So that's why I said the biggest challenge and opportunity is the demography. We call that the price parity terms, we are third or fourth and all that, but that doesn't make much sense when we look at 1.3 billion, and also we have to see that how that wealth is distributed. The people, when they predict, they clearly predict that the China may surpass USA, though it would be very difficult at current juncture for China to think about various other qualities in USA, like democracy, the respect for the individual, competence and the land of innovations and opportunities. Nobody predicts for India that India would, in coming years, really would come to a stature where it would be respected that much. I think this slope has to change, and this slope can be changed. I am convinced that we can change this slope, and we can one day be competing well with China, or even exceeding China, because we have inherent strengths. And we are a democratic country where all the inspirations come from individuals and not is forced from the top. And if you look at the biological system, these systems are better surviving as compared to where it is forced from the top. So I think we have to really look at not be complacent with these kind of a things which word predicts for us to define our own graphs and to define our own slopes. If you look at the word vision of the energy, it is very clear that the coal would decrease, oil and gas would decrease, but not very suddenly. Very slowly, gas would increase, but it is very, very clear indication in the world that the solar, wind, bio, bio-waste, and many other things would increase. But it may not happen for India, even up to 2050 or so, because our dependence on coal is going to be high, and so is going to be for China. But do we have to take again the vision which is expressed by the world? I think we have to define ourselves. To my mind, Humi Baba, what he said in the Indian Institute of Science, almost about 55, 60 years back, for this country, nuclear and solar, at that time wind was not very fashionable to talk, it was not having intrinsic strength to talk. But today I believe that the nuclear, solar, the waste bio, next generation bio, and uh, technologies like that, we must challenge coal and bring the coal to less than 25%. After all, coal is carbon and we need carbon for many other purposes. But this is something which requires a paradigm change and I hope that collectively 
we can take up at all the fronts to be able to say that we must have a sustainable low carbon transition. If you look at the perspective on renewable energies throughout the world, I think wind and solar have grown. In the recent years, solar has started growing at a fast pace because of the competitiveness with respect to other energy resources. Hydro is more or less saturated, and it is not growing much due to various reasons, which we all know, major displacements, the ecosystem's disturbance, and all that. But still, the opportunities are more. There are very scholarly articles which says that without disturbing the ecosystems, we can increase the hydro by a factor of three. I think we must look at very seriously because we have large hydro resources. We are again sort of jammed in our thinking where we are not able to move out. Of course, we have great opportunities in wind and solar, but we have hardly the design of a smallest windmill in India. We have to import even the design of the windmill from outside, though we can manufacture some components and do it. I think we have to really say that just like when Homi Baba said that you must have an engine in the country and you can have boosters from other countries to make a aeroplane flying or a space shuttle going, I think we must have the engines of growth with respect to solar, wind, just like we have in nuclear, but there are other problems in nuclear of scalability and acceptance, but I think we must have the engines of growth in that. And what is today disturbing is that we don't have the engines of growth in the energy, whatever sector you pick up. And that is extremely important for all of us to put our time on. This gives you very broadly but very comprehensively that where the world is putting the energy to solve the challenges of energy which is intimately connected to the climate change. The money is being put on the renewable, some money on nuclear, Power plant with CCS, carbon sequestration, yeah. is little money, no money being put on fossil fuel, in fact, negative, and the extraction of the fossil, uh, fossil fuel, again, negative, and energy efficiency is an area where a lot of money is being put because the returns are more, many innovations are happening, and I think we, in this country, have to have a different model because no country is going to put as much energy in the coming 15 years or 20 years as India is going to put. So we must have our own model as to how much money we want to put in research and development to be able to meet the challenges. Our investments, our size of the groups which are working in various ways are too small to be able to make the real dent and the impact. Innovation would happen, great science would happen, but would we convert the science to technology? It requires human resources and putting the wealth. In fact, in the Planning Commission, last 12th plan when it was being discussed, we had said that why there cannot be a center like Baba Atomic Research Center or Vikram Sarabhai Space Center working only in solar? Why can't there be a center of 3,000 people working on wind which meets the challenges of on-site and off-site? Unless we make those kind of investments, which we could do in 50s, but we are today shying away when the challenge is huge and it is very important for us to address these problems in space. Very busy slide, but I am not going to go through that. But we must understand why the energy security remains a difficult subject, because it has societal connotations. It has environment, huge considerations, economy, because if you put a large amount of energy, subsidies would sooner or later pull you down. It has happened even in the case of a strong economy like Germany, where they sustained solar on the subsidies, but today they find it difficult and they are changing the policy. And it is embedded in the culture. Unless we can see that we are able to make a transition to a cultured society which is different from Western counterparts, we'd always have problems. So we have to have less tolerant and aggressive culture of the West to be replaced by contented and accommodative oriental value system dominance of sectoral interest over collective system. That is where the families, the schools, the educational systems become extremely important. What disturbs you that the today's societies are driven by greed, not by ethics. Global world is being exploited with rich and privilege, deforestation, rising population, degradation mechanisms and the pace of degradation, self-benefits, and so many things. 
So when I go to a physician, if I have one or two problems, my physician is never worried about that. But if somehow he finds that I have ten problems with which I have come in, I think he feels very sort of a difficult to manage my health situation. So I think we have to reduce the variables which are disturbing us to very few so that we can manage that. Today we all find incapable of handling this because the disturbing variables have become very large and we have no equations and no methodologies which we have discovered to be able to do that. These are the scenes which you see all around. The lady sitting there is no different as compared to my mother. I have seen my mother even in worst condition to this, inhaling all the smoke and causing a health problem to herself and to many others. And I think this can change. And this doesn't require big money. This requires only the policies and the management. Why I said so? Because the solutions are around. They are not costly. They are sustainable. They are sustainable at rural level. They are sustain sustainable at low income levels. But we are not replicating. We take great pride, like in X-ray diffraction in the peaks, that I have discovered the element. I have discovered the compound. And it agrees with my theories. But I think the area under the curve in these things is very important. We have failed to produce the area under the curve for all these technologies to make a difference to our lost citizens. Energy sustainability would continue to engage us for a long time, but we can come out with solutions. This country has enough competence and very eminent uh, schools and institutes to be able to do. Whole world is very eager to collaborate with us. We must know where we want to collaborate, how much we want to collaborate. And I think most of all, I put the womb of a mother in the center of the whole thing because womb of a mother is really the ethics. We all forget that we came out of a purity and we become very impure. So I think all the blues and greens and reds are manageable, but the white is difficult to manage. And we all know as we get more power and more money, it is not that our ethics increase. Many a times our ethics decrease and only a few can stand the test of this time. Another very important aspect is that energy, water, health, food, they are interrelated. We have not learned how to connect them together. In fact, very few countries have learned how to integrate that. And today, unless you integrate that, your all policy decisions would go wrong. You cannot make a good policy decision unless you integrate them in an ethical way. And we cannot go by a Western model where we do incremental progress on what West has achieved. I think we all know that our Indian dances are very rhythmic and they are leapfrogging. So I think we have to leapfrog. We have to learn from our culture and get the confidence that we have to leapfrog. Mars mission in the recent months was a great example of our leapfrogging, which touched every child and every person, irrespective of what it was. I think we need in every sphere, including in energy, water, and healthcare, the leapfrogging. But I think country is in a mood and is in a process to be able to do that. When we talk about sustainability, it is not only the human-created wealth, it's a nature repository which we have to give to the next generations and the social values. I think we'd all become almost comparable to non-living if we are not able to sustain our culture, our ways of life, and our ways of looking at the things. So I think today when we talk about smart cities, I believe that unless the social values would be kept in the smart cities, changing cities, and when we define the energy and water requirements, we would keep these social values. I think it's very difficult to really embed these things, whereas other aspects, the science and technology helps. So we have some missing perspectives. Those missing perspectives, we must be able to take into account, model, consideration, and evidence-based policies we must be able to draw to be due. One common example I'd tell you is that when we calculate the energy requirement for this country, we'd say 5,000 units of electricity per person would be required. Today it is only about 800, 900 units per person. Now can you please tell me that how many people would be able to pay for 5,000 units of electricity? I think a vast population of this country would be very happy if I can give just about 200 units of electricity to them. And they would be able to change the quality of life in a quantum way. So why I can't do a simple mathematics where I say that I have different segments in my society and I'd provide the electricity to each one of them depending upon what is needed for their quality of life. But I'd also provide for 
eight, nine, ten percent of growth, but with new technologies and with energy efficiency. If you calculate the energy requirement like that, you would find that you have a very different energy game which we can challenge as compared to 5,000 multiplied by 1.3 billion and all that. It's a very simple thing which has escaped the policy makers and we are still from the academy trying to take up this issue and do it. Again, a busy slide, but again, very, very important point that the Earth planet has its limitation. The time of the Holocene is gone. Now we are living in an Anthropocene, which many scientists, specialists, philosophers, scholars say, we have stress on the biospecies. I think the biggest stress is on biospecies. We are losing biospecies at very fast pace. And many of the challenges which we would face tomorrow would come from the nature. And if the biospecies are lost, we don't know how it would be. We all know the, how the very humble earthworms and bees contribute to our sustainability. So every species contribute in a big way, including to the giant ones. We have problems of CO2. We have problem of the acidity in the ocean. We have a phosphorus and nitrogen fixation problems. Ozone we have fortunately addressed, which gives us a confidence that the globe has together, if takes a challenge, it can be done. This also shows that we are almost knocking at the limits in most of the cases, so we must find the solutions, unlike in the past, at a faster pace. To find good policies and good solutions, I think we have to take into account the price of the pollution. And unless we take the price of the pollution in some way into the account, I don't know what is the best way, but we would not be able to take good decisions for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. And please remember, whatever energy investment we make today, that is for 30, 40 years. Most of the energy systems have a life of 25, 30, 40, 45 years. And the price of the pollution varies in different energy resources. There, have, there was very independent assessment of how the energy would be harnessed in the future. And this article, which is about seven pages, is a, written by a person who is not really in the energy field, and he takes a very unbiased view. And to him, it comes very clear what Homi Baba talked in Indian Institute of Science 50 years back, that nuclear energy is not for everybody, but nuclear energy for some countries is vital, solar is vital, and wind must be harnessed, others must cut down. I think it's a wonderful article. You read it, the articulation, the basis, and the evidence which he gives in a small article is remarkable. Unfortunately, what happens is when we sit in the planning commission, it's a linear. I think it's very difficult in short time to be able to have non-linear paradigm changes. People accept the linear changes much more easily as compared to non-linear. So if you look at our plans for the 12th or the 11th or for the next five years after this, we are going, going on saying coal would increase, oil would bring down, renewable slowly would increase. I think it is not going to help. I think it is going to be too late. So what is the way of doing the nonlinear acceptance to the society is to do foresights. I have not seen a good foresight on energy in all these years when I have been studying. There is no really good foresight which takes into account the social, the culture, the ethical, the humanities, the finance, the science and technology, the requirements, the equity. And our linear models are going to land us in trouble. We also know, most of us have experienced, that today the technology mature, matures in a very short span. Previously, it used to take a number of years because our base in science was less. Our maturity to be able to manufacture and maintain our lifetime was less. So the technologies took a long time to grow. Today, we have the technologies which come very, very fast. And we, if we commit ourselves, we are able to realize these technologies at a faster pace. Working in a mission program for about 40 years, I found what is the difference between the mission and the other program is not the quality of the people, not the money availability. It is that you are supported, you are given a patronage right from a concept to the real system. You don't have to go every two years, three years with a proposal to be able to say that what you are doing. Given that, I think if we have a very strong peer review system, we have a very good societal and policy driven systems I think these are the ways by which you can really challenge the challenges and find the solutions. So there is some mechanism which already we have perfected, thanks to Sthish Tavan, Baba, Sarabhais, and others, 
and this we must carry forward in many other domains. Everywhere we cannot have a commission and a mission, but I think we must follow the basic, uh, basic ingredients of such a system to be able to do. Here in this slide I show that if you change from 5,000 units of electricity to 2,500 units of electricity, and with your culture, innovations, frugal habits, your oriental culture, I don't think human development index is going to be much different as compared to with 5,000 and 2,500. And beyond 5,000, of course, it is well-known fact that it doesn't make the differences. So I think we must evolve our own energy requirements and not take from these graphs as to what it is there. Recently, Switzerland has challenged itself. It was using about 7,500 units of electricity. Now it says that they would get a better quality of life with 2,500 units of electricity. They have challenged themselves that in the next 10 years, they would reduce the energy consumption per capita by one third, but better quality of life. So I think there are examples and we must follow. This again shows that how the energy, water, agriculture, healthcare, they are all interrelated. And we are no models. I think today we have to challenge our best of the people in uh, statistical sciences, domain specialists, economic, social scientists to develop these models. But without these models, I am afraid that we'd be again taking not the right kind of decisions. Now I show a few examples where we were bold and we sort of developed our own science and technology. And today, we are able to go to 700 megawatt pressurized high water reactor, which competes with the rest of the world with respect to safety, with respect to economics. In fact, it is per unit of electricity the most competitive reactor because of various reasons, not being part of a nuclear suppliers club and all that, we are not able to sell it to the world, but otherwise it would be the most competitive, most nuclear safe reactors. But this is a journey which has taken 40 years. Maybe with today's India, we have to take this journey, it would be done in 20 years. But these kind of journeys are possible. Coming to the area of materials, which is also my specialization, this has to be embedded in the business opportunities. And steadily, we have to increase the capability of the materials so that we can go to higher efficiencies and more economy. And this has been demonstrated number of times in the history. This slide I always show because when I just joined the Department of Atomic Energy, I came across this slide. It is by Fermi. I believe there has not been a better genius than Fermi in the area of nuclear science and technology. At that time, I think somewhere in 44, before I was born, he said that the country that learns to build breeder reactor would have solved its energy problems forever because you can perpetually generate the fissile material. You can perpetually burn the waste and you have a very clean system, but the technology is very difficult. It's full of challenges. And then the country which first does a breeder reactor will have a great competitive advantage in atomic energy. India made an early entry into it thanks to Vikram Sarabhai, who with his great relations with France and Homi Baba, who was still around but at a sort of a not very active, it was Vikram Sarabhai who really made the collaboration with France possible. And Raja Ramana was the one who nucleated and grew it. And then we got the first test reactor from them. 